Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here at this conference, and thank you, Christine, for inviting me. Uh, as Christine has explained, uh, she's really very good at extracting penance. Um, immediately after I had made my comments, she got on the phone and said, well, Adair, at least you've got to turn up and uh, speak at the Lendit uh, conference. And she's absolutely right uh, that some comments of mine on peer-to-peer -peer lending produced some response in February this year. So maybe I should begin by explaining what I said and why. Um, I absolutely didn't intend to say anything about peer-to-peer -peer lending. My memory was that the interview was about either Brexit or China or something completely uh, separate. And my comments were made in that classic process when you think the interview is over and the journalist asks one of those final, oh, by the way, type uh, questions, and you say something not thinking that your reply will be of any interest to anyone. Now, I have to tell you that this is a phenomenon with which Christine is familiar. Because back in the days when we were doing the pension commission work, and she was the head of the National Association of Pension Funds, um, she uh, got to the end of an interview about what they thought about the emerging conclusions of the Pension Commission. And when she thought that the uh, tape recorder was off and the interview was over, the interviewer said, oh, what do you think about Adair Turner? And she said, oh, I get on quite well with him. He is a bit of a Stalinist, though. Uh, this, <laughs> this produced a headline of the form, NAF, NAPF head attacks Pension Commission chairman as Stalinist. So, <laughs> You could have thought of my February comments as being Stalin's revenge, but they certainly weren't intended like that. The question I was asked was something like, you know these crowdsourcing systems, these peer-to-peer -peer lending processes in which individuals lend to other individuals or companies, will they entirely replace banks? To which I replied that if you think you can replace good professional credit analysis, with the individual judgment of non-professional investors, relying, as it were, on the wisdom of crowds, that is a delusion. And I said that not immediately, but in, say, five or ten years' time, when we face the next big upswing of irrational exuberance, individual peer-to-peer -peer lending would probably produce losses which would make bankers look like geniuses. And I still believe that that would be the case, and would be a problem for the direct lending industry if it was indeed the model of how direct lending worked. But in fact, individual investor credit assessment and loan choice actually plays only a minor role in many direct lending platforms. And having managed quite unintentionally to create a stir, the side benefit for me of what I said in February is that it's forced me to understand better what most of the industry is doing, which, by the way, is not always clear from what it says on the tin. And as a result, I'm better placed to reflect this morning on what the role of the industry will play relative to banking and whether its growth will make the credit supply system more or less risky. Let me begin with the central problem with which prudential regulators struggle. It's that banks can be very dangerous institutions. They're dangerous because they perform maturity transformation, lending out money for longer term than their liabilities. Dangerous because they're highly leveraged, making promises to depositors who believe their investments are 100% safe because of loss absorption by equity, which even today after all our post-crisis reforms, need only on average be about 5% of total assets or liabilities. And dangerous because in aggregate banks don't just take existing money and lend it on, they in an important and subtle process create money, credit and purchasing power which didn't previously exist. And that is why the banking system as a whole can drive total economy leverage to excessive levels and can generate cycles of credit and real estate price booms and busts 
which are actually not just part of the story of financial instability in modern economies, but again and again, as, for instance, analysis from the Bank for International Settlements have shown, they are the whole story. So banks are dangerous, but they're also economically useful. For there is a good argument that without maturity transformation, which makes it possible for people to fund long-term investments while holding short-term financial assets, it would be more difficult to generate the credit and investment needed within our economy. Which is why our public policy approach to banks is not to prohibit them. We don't say they're so dangerous that they can't exist, but to impose capital and liquidity requirements. Requirements which sadly were far too lax in the years before 2008 and which we subsequently tightened significantly, but which I happen to believe should be significantly tighter still. And I've said before and I'll say it again that if I was the benevolent dictator of a greenfield economy, and I do assure you if I was a dictator I would be a benevolent one rather than a Stalin, if I was the benevolent dictator of a greenfield economy and I didn't have to worry about transition processes, I would want banks levered more like 5 to 1 than the 20 to 1 which we still allow. So banks are useful, but they create major risks. Direct non-bank lending would seem to solve these problems because with non-bank lending, there is no maturity transformation. And there's no leveraged institutions sitting between the end investors and end borrowers, but a direct contractual link with each investor directly owning claims on real borrowers. And it's actually important to remember that non-bank lending has been a very significant part of all credit systems for a very long time. We have always had trade credit extended from one business to another. And that is effectively a form of non-bank lending. And indeed, if you go to places like China, there is a huge flow of informal business-to-business -business credit uh, which exists in many local and sectoral-specific networks. In addition, for over a century, large companies have directly issued single-name bonds which are bought by end investors. And it's actually notable that since 2008, Sluggish bank lending in the US and Europe has been offset primarily by corporate bond issues. And actually, by far the largest increase in non-bank lending has actually arisen from that plain, old-fashioned corporate bond issues rather than new forms of direct lending uh, innovation. And after the 1970s, of course, also, there was an explosion of securitized credit, in particular, in the US mortgage market, but also elsewhere, with multiple individual loans packaged into credit securities sold to end investors who, again, held direct ownership stakes in the underlying loans rather than claims against an intermediating bank. So there's nothing new about non-bank lending. And indeed, it has accounted for many years for about 70% of all lending in the US and about 30% in Europe. Nothing new about non-bank lending. But over the last decade, and at an accelerating pace after the 2008 crisis, we have seen new forms of non-bank direct lending. That has included the growth of private debt funds, pooling the investments of institutional investors and high net worth individuals, and direct lending into the really quite large ticket mid-corporate market. We've had platform lenders concentrating on the small business market and offering to their investors pooled portfolios of multiple small business loans of different combinations of risk and return. We've had other platform lenders performing the same function in the market for personal unsecured loans and others operating in the buy-to-let market. And we have multiple and continually involving business models involving, for instance, an increasing role for institutional investors within the investor base of the lending platforms. And one consequence of all this as, is that it has extended non-bank lending to segments previously entirely dominated by banks, in particular the SME segment, where securitization always, even in the US, played only a trivial role 
in lending provision, but where direct lending platforms are significant and growing. So what benefits could result from this greater role for direct lending? Some rather excited commentary suggests that what we're seeing is a revolution which entails fundamental new approaches to credit underwriting and supply. But what I want to suggest is that the reality is more prosaic than the hype sometimes suggests, but that for that very reason, direct lending is likely to become a stable, significant, and useful part of our total credit supply system. Because while peer-to-peer -peer lending platforms are not deploying a radically new approach to credit analysis, they might, in some cases, be able to do it better than banks, and can, they can certainly, in many cases, do it at least as well while providing better customer service. The idea that peer-to-peer -peer lending is radically different rests on the assumption, which I have to say is out there uh, in, the, uh, in the general ether, that it really is peer-to-peer -peer lending, that individual investors are driving their own selection of individual loans or portfolio of loans, and that the internet has made possible an information exchange rich enough to enable such decentralized credit analysis. But that is not the dominant reality of the emerging industry, at least in the UK. For while the lending platforms are not maturity transforming banks, the core function of many, that many perform is sophisticated and centralized credit analysis, which enables them to present to end investors a choice between portfolios of different expected risk and return. And in many cases, only a very small percentage of investors now directly select specific portfolios of loans, and even those investors typically rely on the platform's centralized credit assessment of the relative riskiness of different loans. And that credit assessment is not radically different in approach to that already deployed and deployed for many years by the incumbent banks. For many years, banks have done credit underwriting for personal unsecured loans on the basis of automated credit scoring techniques, and most platforms logically do the same. For many years, banks have been evolving a hybrid approach to small business credit underwriting with a large and growing role for automated credit scoring, but typically some remaining role for direct human contact. And lending platforms have tended to use the same hybrid approach. While above the small business segment, when we move from, say, loans of £5,000 or £10,000 or even £100,000 to loans of £5 million or £20 million, good credit analysis cannot be wholly automated, either by banks or by lending platforms, but has to depend not only on detailed quantitative analysis, but on judgments about the entrepreneurial and managerial competence of the borrowers, and assessments of the quality of business plans, which often have to be informed by face-to-face -face contact and customer premise visits. This hierarchy of different credit approaches has been in place for many years, and I'm not convinced that the growth of direct non-bank lending, or indeed the use of information technology by challenger banks, will radically change this sort of hierarchy of different, in principle, credit approaches. But while the new lending platforms are not doing something fundamentally new in credit underwriting, both they and the challenger banks might be able, if managed well, to do well-established forms of credit analysis as well or better than the incumbent banks, and they can certainly aspire to provide better customer service. That reflects two important competitive advantages versus incumbent banks. Much tighter customer segment focus, and the ability to get technology right first time, rather than to struggle with existing legacy systems, which is the huge problem of the existing incumbent banks. Yes, banks have been doing automated credit underwriting for unsecured personal loans for years, contradicting any idea that fintech approaches to credit underwriting are entirely new. But platform lenders, with a razor-sharp focus on applying the best big data analytical approaches to a specific chosen customer segment, might be able to do it better. 
And yes, established banks have been doing a hybrid form of credit underwriting for small businesses for years, but it's also true that large established banks have often struggled to achieve sustained focus on the small business sector, often switching its organizational home backwards and forwards between the retail bank and the corporate bank, with the, but with the small businesses always a bit of a Cinderella in either of those homes. A platform lender or a challenger bank totally focused on this customer segment may be able to do credit writing and underwriting at least as well as a major bank while providing better and faster customer service. And for both platform lenders and challenger banks, the freedom to build IT systems from scratch gives, I think, an absolutely enormous service and cost advantage. So while I have my doubts about how fundamentally new direct lending approaches are, and more generally about whether fintech is truly revolutionary, new competitors may still do well simply by executing existing approaches better than the incumbent players can. As a result, I'm certain that many direct lending platforms, or indeed at the larger loan size level, private debt funds, will, along with challenger banks, play an increasing and profitable role within the credit supply system. But will more direct lending also make the financial system more stable, which as a past macro prudential regulator still is something which I care about? There is a prima facie case that it might. Since a system of direct lending will not be subject to the risk of funding runs, which is inherent in any system which has maturity transformation. And because the capacity of lending platforms to help funnel investor money from investors to borrowers is not dependent on the equity of the bank capital equity cushion. With banks, we always face the danger that when the economy turns down and credit losses rise, those real economy effects can be magnified by a credit crunch in which banks which have incurred losses then immediately starts trying to constrain further lending in order to conserve and rebuild capital bases, giving an extra twist to the economic cycle. The banking system, indeed, has an inherent tendency to impart pro-cyclical impetus to both economic upswings and downswings. And while regulators have recognized this and now introduced what is called the counter-cyclical capital buffers to offset this effect, those buffers are still untested and may prove only partially effective. So it seems that, as some people put it, <clears throat> direct lending could add a spare tire to the credit supply system, making credit crunches less likely. And I believe there is some merit in this approach. But I also want to introduce a caveat to that optimistic story, and one with implications for how macro prudential regulators should monitor the evolution of the direct lending market. For we have been here before. With optimistic stories before the 2008 crisis about how non-bank lending through credit securitization was going to make the financial system safer with the spare tire of non-bank credit supply abolishing the credit cycle. Thus, the IMF, in its Global Financial Stability Report of April 2006, noted with approval a growing recognition that the dispersal of credit risk by banks to a broader and more diverse group of investors has helped to make the banking and overall financial system more resilient. This improved resilience may be seen in fewer bank failures and more consistent credit provision. Now, that was written about 15 months before the early stages of the onset of the 2007-08 crisis. And I've always been worried that the staff member who actually wrote this is somewhere tied to the wall in a dungeon in IMF headquarters and no longer allowed uh, to go out and see the light of day because it's just so embarrassing. But similarly, Bill Dudley and Glenn Hubbard argued in an approach a paper which got a lot of circulation that non-bank credit supply was bound to be less volatile and that as a result, note the word, credit crunches of the sort that periodically 
in the past shut off the supply of loans to home buyers are a thing of the past. But in fact, we know, post-2008, that this securitized form of non-bank lending blew up spectacularly, producing first an over-exuberant explosion of credit supply and then a credit crunch quite as bad as any traditional banking system had ever produced. So what went wrong? The answer, I think, lies in the combination of three factors. First, the product complexity introduced by credit tranching. For the credit securities created were not simple pools of loans with all investors receiving pooled combinations of risk and return, nor those simple tiers of risk and return, which I showed earlier, but something different, tranched layers of seniority from super senior to senior mezzanine and equity, designed in a way which was bound to undermine transparency and make it difficult for investors truly to understand what they were investing in. With, of course, the wonderful wrinkle that once we'd done it once, in the magic of the CDO squared, we could take the mezzanine layer and do it all over again, making the best possible prime beef over, out of what you thought uh, was the leftover entrails of the previous sausage. All tranching processes create a significant systemic risk. And that indeed is one reason why banks are systemically risky. Just cast your mind back to my earlier chart. A bank is actually like a sort of giant CDO. It also takes a pool of assets and offers to the liability side a tranche set of risk and return combinations. And it's inherently risky for that reason. But we recognize it, and therefore we apply capital and liquidity requirements to banks. The second thing that went wrong was long and complex distribution chains in which the same securities could pass through multiple different links which introduced maturity transformation at several points in the chain, so that, in effect, the multiple steps together became the equivalent of a maturity-transforming bank, but without us noticing it. Because what you had at these two ends of this chain was over on the right-hand side there a 20-year mortgage to somebody, and on the left-hand side, somebody with what they thought was a capital-certain don't-break-the-buck immediately liquid money market mutual fund investment. Put that all together, consolidate it, and it's absolutely obvious that it's a bank, but because we split it into different chains, we didn't realize that it was creating the same risks of the bank. And third, the fact that the securities with long underlying maturity could be traded in somewhat liquid markets in a process bound to produce risks as well as benefits. Because the crucial thing to understand about market liquidity is that like bank maturity transformation, it usefully makes it possible for short-term investors to finance long-term real economy investments, but that very market liquidity also reduces the incentives for good credit analysis and generates the risk that swings of market sentiment, potentially exacerbated by mark-to-market accounting, may produce swings in credit supply. And as a result of all this, the securitized credit model of the pre-crisis years, far from reducing risks arising from the credit supply system, took the inherent risk of a bank-based system and put the whole system on steroids. Just create, took bank risk and turbocharged it. So finally, what follows for today's non-bank lending system? Seen from the point of view of a prudential regulator, albeit in this case a past one, concerned about future possible systemic risk? The answer is simple. Keep it simple and keep it transparent. For what will worry prudential regulators is if, under the influence of competitive pressure and the continual process of financial innovation, the simple transparent models of today morph into more complex and opaque systems. If loan portfolios are turned into complex trans credit securities and sold along long distribution chains to people who do not have a transparent understanding of what went into the sausage machine.
And if people find ways to introduce leverage and maturity transformation into those chains, giving investors promises of immediate liquidity combined with apparent, though illusory, capital certainty. Provided this does not occur, my judgment is that the direct lending industry will grow and play a useful role alongside tightly regulated banks in our overall credit supply system. How large that role should be, I don't know, but that will be determined by competition, not by the regulators. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Adair, as ever. You've packed an awful lot into that session, and I, I know I, for one, will want to watch it two or three times on the YouTube clip to really get the full value of your, your wise insight and advice. But we have got time for a few quick questions. Cormac. Yeah, that's Can you ask me to say who they are? Yeah, yeah. please yeah. say who you are. Yeah, hi, I'm Cormac from BPC. I thought it was a really interesting uh, talk. Um, one question for uh, Lord Turner. Um, you talked about the fact that banks do liquidity transformation and peer-to-peer -peer as it's currently kind of set up doesn't really do that. But you also mentioned that potentially peer-to-peer -peer can be useful from a systemic point of view because it reduces you know, the systemic points of failure the banks are and can help the economy be less pro-cyclical. And kind of, I've got an idea I wanted to get your reaction to. Is there a logic that the Bank of England should actually be willing to backstop peer-to-peer -peer loans in a crisis at, say, a 5% discount to par? And at that point, people can have 100% certainty that their peer-to-peer -peer loans are actually liquid. And therefore, effectively, the peer-to-peer -peer system becomes very sustainable right yeah. through the cycle. And it's a, it's a better way to run the financial system. Well, this is a debate uh, which broke out not specifically in relation to peer-to-peer -peer lending, but, for instance, in relation to money market funds and other parts of the shadow banking system post-2008, where, by the way, effectively the Federal Reserve did provide a sort of market maker of last resort, uh, a capacity, uh, as well as a classic discount window uh, lender of last resort to the banking system. I think the answer is only if you accept that the flip side of that is going to have to be capital and liquidity controls and, and requirements. You've either got to say this is a totally transparent system which will have to uh, survive on its own two feet and we're not going to provide a liquidity backstop, or if you are going to provide a liquidity backstop, you have got to then step in, as we do with the banks, and say, you know, w w we then have the right and the requirement uh, to regulate, you know, what are the liquidity promises you're making. I think seen from a regulator, there is always a danger in a lack of transparency uh, as to what is the nature of the promise. In, in particular, this was a huge problem in, in the US where the money market funds were essentially meant to be sort of platform lending funds. You know, you did your investment and your investment was meant to go up and down with the value of the underlying instruments. But over time, people assumed that these were capital-certain investments, that they were capital-certain investments which were also totally liquid. Now, a capital-certain investment which is totally liquid is a deposit. You know, <laughs> if it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. And so what we ended up deciding was that if there were money market funds which were promising, don't break the buck, capital certain immediately liquid uh, a, uh, a promises, they had to be subject to capital and liquidity requirements like a bank. So that's the general principle with which we approach this issue. Any more questions for Adair Turner? No. Well, oh, there's one over there. Stuart. Um, yeah, Stuart Law, Asset Capital. I'd just be interested, uh, you, you made a very specific comment about the relative leverage of um, your preferred relative leverage of banks uh, being uh, 5 to 1 rather than 20 to 1. It's, it's a figure that's in our head as well. Do you think there is a place for a banking two license for simpler private banks should some alternative lenders wish to move in that direction? And we know the FCA is considering looking at some people and whether they are a bank potentially. 
Do you think there is a place for a Banking 2 license for simpler, non-leveraged, uh, one-to-one matched, non-term transforming uh, alternative finance providers to sit yeah. in that new box? Well, with 20% I, I don't know whether you'd need a completely separate license, but I, I have always hankered, having run you know, a major regulator with huge supervisory you know, staff, for, and actually, I will say, a lot of people in the same position as me around the world, having gone through these debates, hanker after higher leverage, tougher leverage requirements and less onerous supervision. I mean, the way I sometimes think about what we've done with the banking system before the crisis is that we had this sort of truck heading down a road with inadequate brakes and inadequate crash barriers. So to try and make it safe, we crowded a whole load of supervisors into the driver's cab <laughs> to look over his shoulder, right? It would be far better to have equity requirements for banks sufficiently high that in almost all states of the world that you could imagine, it was obvious that the only people who could lose was the equity holders, which then is for the board of directors to relate with them and to look after their investment and to make appropriate risk return trade-offs. So um, I still, like a lot of regulators who, I mean, a lot of us went through the process of re-regulating the banking system with debates about whether we were going to increase the capital ratio by a half percent here or a half percent there. And a lot of us said at the end of the day, you know, again, keep it simple. I mean, at one level, I wish we, we hadn't had to go down the route of bail-inable debt. I mean, bail-inable debt for a banking system is equity when you need it. So if it's equity when you need it, why not make it equity in the first place? So the, I, I would tend across the, the whole process to try to say, when a bank is running with a high equity ratio, if a bank chose to come in and said, I'm going to run with an equity ratio of 25%, that's the way I want to run the banking, my bank, I think it would be logical for the regulator to say, well, the good news is we probably don't have to supervise you all that intensively, other than them to check that we think that the equity ratio is well designed. Whether that would be best expressed as a completely sort of two parallel uh, uh, licenses, I don't know. But certainly that's the principle which I support. Final quick question. Lady here. Effie Pilarino with Daily Fintech. What I heard from you today is how to prevent a, a, a repeat of the 2008 crisis, but we all know that the next crisis will not come with the same dress or the same yeah. uh, appearance as the previous one. It will come, I don't know, as a black swan or whatever. So uh, I'm not sure that what we heard from you is useful for the regulators or for uh, the market? Well, <laughs> if you believe... Oh, there you go. Uh, the, 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 the problem with uh, your assertion is that if you believe that by definition the next problem is an unknown unknown and as a black swan, well, there's nothing any of us can ever do because it is by definition completely unknowable. Um, actually, yes, we do have to guard against things which are completely new and we had no idea. but. We do also have repeats of previous problems. I mean, the fact that there are, there are new problems doesn't mean there aren't repeats of previous problems. Indeed, one of our big problems have been we have failed to learn from the past. I mean, take the tendency of the banking system and the shadow banking system to lend too much money against property, which drives up property prices, which then brings in more lending against that, which produces a crash, which dumps the uh, economy into a recession in which it's very difficult to pull out. That wasn't a black swan in 2008. There was a canary in the mine, you know, singing away at us for 20 years, and it was what had happened in Japan. And we failed to learn the problems of the past. And if I had given a speech here 10 years ago and said, this is what happened in Japan, you might have said, well, that's all very interesting, but it's completely irrelevant because the next problem is going to come from a black swan. But you'd have been completely wrong. 
because actually the next problem came from exactly the same grey or spotted or whatever swan uh, occurred in Japan in the 1980s. <laughs> On that note, we're going to end. Adair having the last word.